We'll start recording. Hello, this is the 36th District Democrats. We are so delighted this afternoon to be inter interviewing Bob Kettle, who is running for Seattle City Council position seven. Bob, welcome to the 36th. We would like you to introduce yourself over to you. Uh, great, thank you, Tyler. Thank you for everyone uh, for giving me this opportunity to speak uh, to the 36. I really appreciate it, particularly as a member of the 36 LD uh, Democrats. Why am I running? Uh, I'm running because of my concern <clears throat> about the city council's failure uh, to address you know, our city's challenges and issues to include public safety, public health, homelessness, and affordable housing. Um, I'm looking to, as in my run, so I'm running to bring my experiences and perspective to the challenges that we're facing. As you may have seen in the backgrounders, I am a uh, retired Naval officer, so I had a career in, in the Navy that had me living in different cities across the country and the world. And importantly, I, uh, towards the end of that time period, I chose Seattle twice. And uh, now in the last decade, I've been uh, becoming a Seattleite. Um, this experience, uh, starting with you know, being a grad student at the Evans School at the UW, uh, to being a civic volunteer with a number of different organizations to include the World Affairs Council, which I started the, uh, pretty much a decade ago, the VFW, and importantly, the Queen Anne Community Council and the Queen Anne Block Watch Network and the West Precinct Advisory Council. All those uh, groups uh, gave me some great insight into the issues that are facing our city. Uh, but most importantly, uh, I became a stay-at-home dad. I, my daughter is seven, almost eight. She's a second grader at St. Anne's. And uh, I am bringing all those three elements into my run for District 7. So bringing that leadership, you know, leadership with the North Star to make it a thriving, vibrant city. And also, I'd like to ask that, you know, and state that right now it looks like there's two Democrats in this race. Uh, for the D7, and I'd like to see the motion for a dual endorsement uh, for the two Democrats, the incumbent and myself, as we press forward in this race. Thank you, Bob. The first question today will be asked from Clayton. Over to you, Clayton. Uh, you're you're mute. muted. You're muted, Clayton. You're muted. Let me work on getting the unmute. There we go. I beg your pardon. Excuse me. I, I, that was extraordinarily thick. Um, what steps would you take to ensure that the city remains safe for all, including Black, Indigenous, and LGBTQ plus people while keeping police accountable to elected leadership and community? I think uh, it's first, it's very, very important to uh, that we as a city acknowledge that people of different races uh, experience policing and public safety differently, um, and that these experiences need to be heard and central in our discussion of reform. Um, so many things that need to happen and have been happening continue to be built upon. This past week, I attended the African American Community Advisory Council meeting, um, which itself was at the Garfield Community Center, which itself was held up because the facility was on lockdown. And unfortunately, a young man was shot in the leg, uh, not too far away from the, the play fields, just to the south of that, the community center. And so that community center was locked down. And so it's just a stark example of the challenges that we face and how we've gotten to this position where we do not have the resources to help those individuals have the public safety that need. And again, this was you know the African-American uh, Community Advisory Council, which had representatives from the LGBTQ Advisory Council and others. And it was such a, again, stark point to, to know how important this is to understand that these areas uh, across the city uh, need to be front and center in this effort. Um, consent decree is so key. The organizations that came out of that, the OPA, the Community Police Commission is so key. And we have made progress, but we need to continue to make progress. About two weeks ago, I attended the Before the Badge uh, program. And I spent two hours with the new recruits. 
And it was so important to do so, to learn what the police department and others Seattle U are doing to create the new police force that we have. And so moving forward, we have to build on that and get to a point where we're all safe. Thank you, Bob. The next question will be asked by Ethan. Yeah, hey, I appreciate, thank you for meeting with us. Um, how would you ensure the city has an updated climate action plan and what specific actions would you prioritize to get us back on track to meeting Seattle's Green New Deal goals? Yes, thank you. I've lost my uh, my timer, but that's fine. Uh, you know, both my incumbent opponent and I are both pro-environment, as uh, you would expect from our democratic uh, ideals and priorities. We need to press forward on all the issues, uh, parts of the climate action plan and the, the Green New Deal. You know, we talked about reducing emissions, you know, transportation, land use, building energy, along with waste. I learned in this process of becoming a candidate that uh, we essentially have an urban data farm downtown that has you know 50 megawatt directed power to it, and they were having issues with the cooling systems. And so, just this is just like as an example, it was an Amazon facility. They were looking to find ways to address this. So what they've done is they've taken the heat from that process and created a heat exchange. So now, the data farm is essentially heating a number of different Amazon buildings downtown. We have to be smart about this, both from a government, but also from the private sector as well, and look for, you know, working together to develop solutions in this area. And I think that is like a fantastic, you know, example of how we can do things better moving forward. And uh, part of this too is, for, you know, preparing for climate change. These are some of the things that we need to be aware of, you know, particularly since we're a port city and we have some low lying areas, we need to go through, and be smart about this. You know, I also take talk about uh, public safety being, you know, crime and security, fire rescue, and emergency preparedness. We have to look at the emergency preparedness piece because it's going to have an impact, particularly if we have something like a natural disaster, earthquake, or tsunami. And so we have to prepare for the uh, climate change. So we can all do this as you know, individuals and as a community uh, to prepare for this and to move forward on what's been done and be smarter about doing it and being innovative. Thank you, Bob. The next prepared question will be asked by Toby. Over to you, Toby. Uh, yes, and uh, uh, Bob, you can see the uh, clock by hitting the carrot or left or right to move the... Uh, oh, yes, I was doing that and uh, it uh, wasn't doing it initially, but it's up there now. It's actually right next to you. Thank you. All right, thank you. Uh, uh, the move Seattle levy is set to expire at the end of 2024 20, next year. The next nine year transportation levy will go before the voters in November of 24 to begin in 2025. What investments and improvements would you prioritize for the next transportation levy? You know, the move Seattle levy uh, is a fantastic way to, you know, make our city safer. And I think that's something that we need to build upon. Uh, during my time on the uh, community council, the Queen Anne Community Council, particularly before the pandemic, um, twice a year, we would have meetings. Uh, first, traffic safety, which we would have with SPD, and then pedestrian safety with SDOT. And we found ways to make move Seattle, move Queen Anne safer. And I think we need to look to build on that and for district seven in, in my case but all of seattle in terms of how do we make our streets safer more accessible to people and bicycles and have that ability to you know really have a thriving and vibrant downtown and overall city environment thank you bob the last question prepared question before follow-ups will be asked by judy over to you judy to ask question four the uh, the city has been in a homelessness state of emergency since 2015 yet our homelessness crisis has not receded what are we doing wrong and what steps will you take to address the crisis you know, the, the homelessness crisis is real. It is something that essentially the failure to address the homelessness crisis is basically an outrage for us as a community, for us as a city. And the city council 
has a role in that and its failure to do that. And I think, you know, I'm reminded again, going back to my time on the, our community council, you know, during the time of Mayor Ed Murray and going over the, the initial response. And I, and I said to myself, how do we effectively manage to push this forward? It seemed unwieldy at the time, the span of control was not there. And I think the city was unable to really address the issues that were there, um, working with different providers to ensure that the best of the best was moving forward and in really getting results. And I think the city has fail failed to really oversee this process and give it the accountability that it needed. And because of that, we just kind of drifted. And then we've also looked to do with, you know, King County Regional Homeless Authority, doing some of the same things. Uh, we need to have aggressive oversight that really looks at the results and getting to where we need to be. Um, I say that too, by the way, you know, some of you sitting here in Queen Anne that we as a community have supported, for example, the Oloa Inn, now called the Inn. We've supported the 157 Roy Street. We've supported the Inn at Queen Anne, the DSE facilities on 15th, the tiny village uh, there at the, the intersection of Elliott and 15th. But what we need is a city that is working these issues and being in a position to really get what needs to be done, done in terms of solving this crisis. Thank you so much, Bob. We'll go into follow ups. These will have a shorter amount of time to answer. And Jeremy is asking our first follow up. Um, you had mentioned in the response to your first uh, question um, the um, some of the things that came out of the consent dec decree and specifically men mentioned the OPA. Um, do you feel like the OPA is effectively doing a timely and um, job of oversight and that and that it's really able to really perform true oversight given its relationship with the department itself? I don't think it's been timely. I don't think it's been um, to the place it needs to be. Um, the consent decree in my mind is really pushed forward the department. And before the badge program that I mentioned really is like exhibit A in terms of what a successful uh, outcome that we've been getting in terms of the consent decree. The organizations themselves, this kind of goes back to my point about the, the city council and with homelessness, they've had their challenges to include the community and police commission. Uh, but now they've gotten in the place where they can move forward and be more timely to your point regarding the OPA and to address the, you know, the issues that have come out in terms of the interactions between police officers and the, and the community. Thank you, Bob. The next question will be asked by Clayton. Um, Hi, Bob. I, uh, I really liked your um, example of the Amazon buildings uh, using the heat that's generated by their, their uh, 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 data facilities uh, in our neighborhood. I liked it because it suggests the idea of paradox. And it suggests the idea of, uh, of the city as a whole. Uh, so uh, my question is, um, how amenable would you be to that frame of our, of our problems, including our homeless problem, which is also um, a problem of money? Um, Amazon has a problem paying taxes to the city of Seattle. Um, so the paradox is we have enormous wealth. Next to the enormous wealth, we have just astonishing homelessness. The enormous wealth has not absorbed in some positive way people who have been displaced by you know, wildly increasing housing costs. So um, how, about, how about viewing homelessness through the lens of paradox? Thank you, Clayton. 
you know, as you're saying that, you know, the paradox, I was remembering my time when I was in Moscow as an attache, um, which is just as my first choice of choosing Seattle that I mentioned earlier, and the paradox of having incredible amount of wealth on um, Krutovsky Prospect, and then just one block over an elderly Russian woman trying to sell some clothes uh, because she had nothing uh, really. And to your point that 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 image is, you know, in my mind from that experience, but also from what we see in the city is untenable and not right when you come down to it. And we need to get to a place where we can have all stakeholders in the city, whether it's residents, but importantly, our business community, uh, fully participate in the, in the process. And, and that requires the city council to also to engage uh, with the business community and to have that uh, understanding that, hey, everybody has a stake, everybody's going to be participating in its solution. And to your point, along with the part of that. Thank you. Thank you. Toby, up next. Hi. Inclusionary housing is a legal mechanism to require low income housing in the expanded capacity from up zones, would you support implementing that mechanism? I think, can you say that again, please? Inclusionary housing is a legally authorized mechanism to allow the city to require low income housing when up zoning. Would you support that? I support the idea uh, generally um, because we do need to get, this highlights a frustration of mine, you know, and, and it goes back to some of the other questions in terms of, you know, the city council holding the different parts of the city accountable, like the mandatory housing uh, affordability program. You know, I just live about 12 blocks from the old Seattle children's home. That was a, a fantastic opportunity to bring in various levels of affordable housing into that location, but it didn't happen. Now we as a you know a community engaged and we so we saved a number of trees, for example. I spoke to the Urban Forestry Commission, but in the end, we have 59 townhomes at that location, all a million plus. And so the to include the lower and mil, you know, middle income, you know, kind of housing options, we need a program that looks to do so and not give an out, at least an easy out, to those that are developing the process uh, the property, to which then ends up being. 59 townhomes, all worth a million plus. Thank you. We could have one more quick follow up. And if I don't see a hand pop right now, Jasmine, over to you. Sure. Um, just to follow up on your response to the first question as well, you mentioned the African American Advisory Council, and is that the one that's housed under Seattle Police Department? And if so, how do you see organizations like that being able to hold uh, the um, police department accountable and to engage in a really authentic and safe way for uh, folks who are distrustful of police to uh, show up to, into these spaces. Jasmine, good to see you again first. Um, to answer the last part, I go back to what I said, we have to acknowledge and understand that everybody experiences police and public safety differently. We, we have to start from that point. And I recognize that not everybody within the community is listed in that first question uh, have that under, you know that that sense from the police and the public safety uh, world. Um, I will say um, that the African American um, Community Advisory Council is led by uh, Victoria Beach, who is a very strong advocate for her community, along with Reverend Walden, who was at the meeting as well, and are do not hold any punches back in terms of their engagement with the police. And that's something too that I can bring as well. I will hold the police accountable. Uh, from my position, partly because, you know, I'm a former uniform officer myself, obviously with the military, but I can do that um, combined with the, the experience that I have to include here in Seattle with the standing up the public safety community for the Queen Anne Community Council, 
you know, the Queen Anne Block Watch Network and also being on the West Precinct Advisory Council, where in those meetings I've held, I pushed back on the, on the uh, previous West Precinct captain on an issue related to, uh, you know, personnel. And so I have no problem doing that. And as a city council member, I will definitely hold the police department accountable, starting with the leadership, because we have to have the accountability and transparency. We also have to make sure training is there from start to finish. And that's why I love the Before the Badge program, but that's not just it. It has to continue all the way through. And to ensure that we have a good relationship with the, with the, uh, with the, uh, the various communities in our city. And I think we can do that with leadership that holds them accountable, that is engaging uh, with the police department. Uh, and by the way, it, and it's not, should not just be the police department. One of the things I will say, and this kind of circling back to the first question is that we cannot succeed in public safety if we don't succeed in public health. And public health primarily meaning you know, behavioral health and addiction. We need to let the police focus on its mission sets to include violent crime and property crime and demand towards that, you know, that mission set, but then separately create alternative capacities. There's been a lot of talk over the last four years about creating different capacities and none of it's really materialized, but we do need to have that happen to, to help address the challenges that we're seeing in the public uh, health uh, world. And then that way we can truly get to some success. Otherwise we're running to stand still, both in public safety and public health. Thank you so much, Bob. That concludes the formal part of our interview with you. So we will stop.